listen to what we are doing because i'm saying we, we really this message i wanted to get into you because i want you to be ambassadors when you leave this conference you go out there and tell people we can function like god are you hearing me do you know who you are no look at your neighbor say neighbor no 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 your neighbor your neighbor is too calm look at you and say neighbor no no your neighbor is too relaxed find somebody who is ready i say say neighbor no 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 say neighbor don't you know that you are a god hallelujah We Christians, we are too casual. If somebody is telling me that, don't I know that I'm a God? Then I say, hey, nee. you, you, you say, what? Well, I'm a God. Chineke. Good day. Good to be back with you. Once so often we find that uh, various churches in our area and also in South Africa specifically uh, have grown to such a capacity and such a degree that they basically are unmissable. And some of these churches in South Africa, unfortunately, it is birthed from sort of what I call a hyper faith or even sort of a, a manifest sons of God movement and word of faith influence. And in that, what we see and what we witness is that various people are standing up within these congregations and they author and they declare themselves to be prophets or apostles or bishops and they start speaking authoritatively from that stance. Now, the scary thing is that various people give these individuals a place to speak and a platform to listen uh, because they are so desperate in their circumstances. Two individuals that have uh, sort of crossed paths and that I've seen often mentioned uh, in various circles, white and black, uh, interdenominational, does not matter, is Prophet Hubert Angel and also Prophet Ed uh, Bronson. Now, these two individuals a whole to a doctrine that I want to specifically look at. And let me just say, when you look at the teaching, there's so many things that you can take. There's so many ideas that they postulate that it's going to basically be impossible just to get into the ideas of all these things. But at the heart of what I want to discuss with you today is this idea of the sort of little gods doctrine, that we are little gods. And, you know, they use different scriptures like Psalms 82 verse 6 and 7. They also look at John chapter 10 verse 38. And what they do is, is they basically depict a, a, a sort of understanding that as sort of the sons of God or the manifest presence of God or being little deities like God, you know, we can do various things and produce various results. It's not surprising, though, to see that in this epistemology that they use, that God gets a bit lesser and lesser and man gets a bit deified and pushed up. Uh, so we see sort of a, a demotion of God and sort of a elevation of man or a deification of man. Interestingly enough that uh, what they do in this specific video is they, they try to convince people that they are little G's or little gods. And then what is also laced in their teaching is the understanding or idea that you have to use uh, sort of the force of faith. Um, and then also it spills over to a formula understanding of faith. Uh, and then also ultimately it, it speaks of the faith of God when they quote scriptures like Mark chapter 11 uh, verse 21 to 23. And what we see is that man is sort of not solely dependent on God, but he is a God that can form his own future, that can judge, that can realize, that can bring forth finances in all these various things through their confession by the creative power of their own word. Now, let me just say, this is nothing different than the metaphysical cults. And this is obviously a heresy. But I want us to investigate a few things that have been said. And uh, unfortunately, like I said, there's so much to go into. But ultimately, when we look at this, we need to understand that these individuals are given an authority due to their prophetic stance. Uh, and they do miraculous things. There's no doubt. Uh, we see them telling people their age. We see them who they're married to. We can see they even tell people exactly how to find their churches uh, describe different addresses tell them their futures tell them their situations word for word you know so 
there are various things that are supernatural, but let me just caution you and say, just because somebody's got the title prophet, and just because there's sort of the evidence of the supernatural, it does not mean that it's directly from God or even biblical. And this is very important for us to look at. Also, let me just say that for these individuals, the reason they have this incredible voice is because of their gift. There's an incredible emphasis on the prophetic. Uh, some of them even have prophetic schools where they train other people to become prophets. Uh, we won't say if it's prophet of a PH or a prophet of an F. But ultimately what we see is, is that these individuals deduce authority from God and usurp authority from God and ultimately declare that if you say the right thing and if you hail the right thing, you can accomplish it. So in this world of faith, we see number one, that God is sort of subservient to faith. Uh, so if you confess, God has to perform what he has promised. And this God is not sovereign, but ultimately that there's a, a situational power in man that needs to be realized for man to become this little God. Uh, let me just also say that it's very interesting that even though they hold the prophetic and high esteem, we need to understand that these individuals obviously speak from a place where the prophetic is something that is seen that have not passed away with the apostles and is something that is current and present. Uh, and even the scriptures like Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 says that in the days past God spoke through his prophets but now he speaks through Jesus Christ. Uh, he's sort of washed away and covered up uh, and other scriptures are used to sustain uh, basically what they are doing. So I want us to look at a few, a few clips and to evaluate them biblically and ask a few questions about this. If we read our Bible, Pastor, do you know what the Bible says? It says, don't you know, it's a question. A question to somebody it says don't you know don't I know what it says don't you know that you are gods no 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 I think this is in my Bible because you are, you are not hearing this it says don't you know that you who who he says, don't you know, it, it is God bringing you into remembrance. He eh? says, don't you. Because when we're saying, don't you know, it is like God is reminding you something you've forgotten. He says, don't you know that in Genesis 126, I made you to be like a God. So that is why he's saying, don't you know that ye are gods. Are you hearing me? And there comes your grandmother, your grandfather, your uncle, yeah, that your friend, and say, You will not get married over my dead body. Say, Che! Hey! Don't you know I am a God? Am I talking to somebody? Then somebody comes and say, You will never buy that car. And say, Hey! Don't you know? I am a God. Are you hearing me? Somebody says you will die poor. You will never be a millionaire and say, Hey, don't you know that I am a God? I hope you're shocked as I am. You know, God speaks to the prophet of Zion, Isaiah 43 verse 10, and I want to read this to you. God speaks to him and he says to him, no God was formed before me, and there will be none after me. Millard J. Erickson in his wonderful textbook, Christian Theology, writes the following, and I want to read this to you on page 510 and page 514. He says the following, and he speaks quite clearly and emphatically when he says this. He says the following. He says, we are a creation of God, not an outflow from him. We have limited knowledge and power, and although the aim of the Christian life is to be spiritually one with God, humans will always be metaphysically separate from God. Then listen to this on page 514. He says, there are definite limitations upon humanity. Humans are creatures, not a God, and have the limitations that go with being finite. Only the Creator is infinite. Humans do not and cannot know everything. God knows everything. 
Uh, let me just say this to you that we hear often it's been spoken and it's being said that, that ultimately, you know, when we when we look at a scripture like Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, we need to focus on two words. We need to focus on the words likeness and we need to focus on the other word, which is basically uh, image. And when we look at these words, we need to understand that that does not speak of us being ontologically unified with the divine being divine. Ultimately, Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 5 to 8 speaks to us, and it shows us quite clearly that Jesus was the only Son of God by very nature, but we are sons and daughters of God by adoption. Uh, that is what Galatians chapter 4, verse 5 to 8 says. Uh, ultimately, we need to understand that the scripture shows us in John chapter 1, verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 18, that Jesus was the only unique Son. He, he was the only begotten. He was the monogamous. He was the unique generated Son of God. But we are not. And ultimately we can see in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 and John chapter 1 verse 1. And ultimately in Galatians chapter 4 verse 8. That, that Jesus is ultimately the Son of God. Now let me just say this as well because this is very important for us to look at. When we look at the interpretation of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. There's two Hebrew words that have been used. And the first one he speaks of is likeness. In the Hebrew word for, for likeness is demuth, D-E-M-U-T-H. And when we look at this, even this scripture actually denotes a limitation because we made in the likeness, we are not in made in the karakter, we're not made in the exact presentation or representation of Christ. But the second word that we, we've been asked to look at is image, which is tselem. Uh, and let me just say to you, when we look at these two Hebrew words, we need to understand that these two Hebrew words denote a separation and not a similar identity as God. Scholar Hank Hanegraaff writes the following. I'm going to read this to you because it's so good. He says, the Hebrew word for likeness simply means similarity or resemblance, not identity. He goes even further and he says the following. He says, it's also clear in the broader context of scripture that humans do not possess the divine nature of God. First, if we are exact duplicates of God, uh, and we, of course, are men, then God must be a man. And we know that God is not a man. Secondly, he says, God himself makes it often uh, makes statements of incomparability within Scripture. He says the following. He says, how can there be any exact duplicates of God? As God states in Exodus chapter 9, verse 14, there is none like me in all the earth. Thirdly, Although we are created in the image of God, we possess none of God's non-transferable and incommunicable attributes such as self-existence, immutability, eternality, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and absolute sovereignty. Even God is ultimately eternal. But man has been created in the point of time. A man is ultimately only here for a brief existence upon earth, according to Job chapter 7. And ultimately, man is dependent on God to sustain him. Man is not a God. Man is not just a little God. And let me just say to you, when we look at these doctrines, it confuses people and it tells people that they are great. Isn't that the greatest deception the devil has ever told? Is that there's nothing wrong with you. You're a God. I will be like the Almighty. This is heretical. And this is a doctrine of demons. In the image of God and is in likeness. Now in likeness, now God does not know what to do. What do I do? And God said, no, I will create animals. Functionality is what he's now looking for. Does this boy who walks, talks, looks like me, act like me? Does he function like me? And the Bible says, God did not create the animals. He formed them. Formed means not breathing into them. He formed them. He says, boy, these are the animals I have formed, not created. It's about to be Old Testament for you. And I'm in the New Testament right there. And the way to see what you would call them. The word to see means test. And the word call means bring to life. So the one who brought these animals to life was Adam, not God. This is simply shocking. You know, it's interesting to see that he makes the following statement. He says that God formed creatures, basically empty shells,
and then man breath breathe their life into these empty shells you know it is just shocking if you look at this and let me just read you a few scriptures that sort of gives us an understanding of god number one being the one that brings things to life and not man uh, listen to this scripture in isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 it says the following for thus saith the lord who created the heavens and the earth he is the god who formed the earth and made it he established it and did not create it in waste or as a waste place but formed it to be inhabited i'm the lord and there is no one else listen to this portion of scripture that is found uh, in nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6 you alone are the lord you have made the heavens the heavens of the earth with all the hosts the earth and all that is in it the seas and all that is in it then you give life to all of them and the heavenly hosts found out before you when we look at this interpretation of this verse this is just an absolute fallacy man nowhere in no form had any work or had anything to do with anything in the created order and when he speaks about calling something into existence again remember it speaks of the creative words the creative power of man that is now given to man in the word of faith understanding that hebrew word yikra is basically a word that is also used for those who pronounce and call upon the name of the lord to be saved it doesn't speak in any way or form of a creative ability we need to understand scripture says quite clearly that god created by himself and ultimately man is not involved in any way or form let me read you another scripture in Isaiah chapter 66 verse 22. For my hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being, declared the Lord. Man has got not a part to play in creation. This is just absolute heresy. Can I prophesy and I talk to somebody here? If in your walk with Christ, we are yet to see the spirituality of God in you, you have not started yet. begin to ask themselves and say this man how come he can come to anybody and begin to speak things in the life of that person why what you see when I come to you when I come and I say can I speak to you you are seeing the image but when I begin to speak hidden things I am speaking on the likeness of God I am now magnifying the likeness of God the unseen part of God am I talking to somebody here God use me why not me see angels why not you are created in the likeness of god therefore when you speak angels are supposed to obey it's your command they are able to obey i wish i had somebody this afternoon listen to me i have come here this afternoon to speak to somebody here your image needs to be at par with god your likeness needs to be at one with God. You need to function like God. Hey, I read my Bible and I got the revelation that God created me in his image and likeness. Then I know that this is the same God. This is the same God who destroyed Pharaoh's army by a flood. Am I talking to somebody here? Am I talking to somebody here? This is the same God that killed Herodias. Hallelujah. While he sat on the throne. Then I looked at myself and he says, he created me to function like him. There is a Herod in my life. There is a Pharaoh in my life. That Herod that is in my life, don't you know that I am a God? Your neighbor is not listening to me. The day you come to this realization, no one and nothing can overcome you. You are not hearing me. No powers in the heavens, on the earth, underneath the earth can consume you. The day you know that you are a God. God is about to give you power to command finances. I wish I had somebody who say God is about to give you power to command fire. To command 
When you speak, money will listen. For the Bible says, money answereth all. If money can answer, it can hear. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me, somebody? I just want to break down for you quickly what has taken place in all these little clips. From the very start, we see that there is a demand placed on normal church individuals to produce these miracles to sort of prove their divine status amongst others. You know, it's just incredible to see that when Jesus speaks of those who look after miracles or who desire miracles or seek the miracles even to define themselves, he reminds them in, in Matthew chapter 12 verse 39 and also in Matthew chapter 16 verse 4, that the wicked is looking for signs and miracles. Let me just say that even in Pharaoh's court, even though Moses performed signs, that even the magicians there could perform false signs to validify their own authority. So demands of miracles is not a sign of godliness. Secondly, we heard a demand being placed on individuals to command their angels, and angels will command and be commanded and obey their bidding because they are made in the likeness of God. Let me just say this to you, that in Psalms 91 verse 11, uh, in Luke chapter 4 verse 10, we can see that it is God who commands His angels, not man. Nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to actually command angels. We see things like, send out your angels. And I've, uh, earlier, uh, I've made another clip of Prophet Bashiri that also speaks of angels and demons. And you can go have a look at that if you really have the appetite for this. But ultimately, we are not the ones to command angels. The angels hearken to the word of the Lord. And they will do what God commands them to do in His bidding. Uh, also, we hear that we are to judge like God. Let me just say this to you. And I want to read this to you in, in the book of James. In the book of James, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, it starts off and it says the following. It says, There is one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. There is one lawgiver and judge. That is God. It is not man. We cannot place ourselves in the final eschatological judgment of all mankind next to God, saying, Lord, I'm going to pronounce the judgment. That is not biblical. And, and then lastly, we hear and we see that there is a demand placed on individuals to demand and to command finances. And, and we read, and I just want to read this to you because it's quite comical. But when we read the scriptures, we can see that this individual quotes uh, 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 Ecclesiastes. Uh, and then he says the following, he says, you can command finances uh, and because money has a money, money can hear, it, it, you, know, you can command it. Let me read to you the context of Ecclesiastes. It says the following in, in verse 17, it says, blessed are you, land in your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Because of laziness of the roof caves in and people are negligent in the house that leaks. A feast is prepared for laughter and wine makes life happy. And money is the answer for all things. This portion speaks of a king that is wicked. A king that oppresses people. A king that actually uh, 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 depicts a kingdom that is sort of going to line and wind up in ruin. So yeah, uh, if you want to command finances, just remember the context of the scripture. And also remember that those who seek to command finances... Ultimately, your source is not finances and you commanding and demanding blessings. Ultimately, and you see, this is what makes it so difficult to make people to see. It is so appealing because it is very pragmatic and it puts you in a spot where you can command these things. Let me just say to you, this is never the intention of Scripture. The intention of Scripture is to believe God to provide for you your daily bread. Why daily bread? Not your, why, not, why not your monthly groceries? Well, simply because if you have your monthly groceries, you're just going to remember that one day you need to ask. But if you ask for your daily bread, you stay in a perpetual and absolute, just a, a absolute a, 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 a longing after God. Just an absolute dependence on God. And ultimately, that is what God is after. When we look at the demand for miracles, when we look at angels being commanded, when we look at judgment, that we can make judgments because we are made in the image of God. And lastly, that we can command finances. Why do we need God? We need God. We do not need to be like God. We need a God. And let me just say this to you, that the worst false sense of security is in us being our own gods.
that destroyed us. That is what happened in Genesis chapter 3. The moment we said, we can do it. The moment we declared personal autonomy. Guess what happened? The fall. Listen to what Psalms 115 says. Psalms 115 says the following from verse 1. And I'm going to read verse 1 and 3. It says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name we give glory. Because of your faithful love and because of your truth. Verse 3. Our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. Our God does whatever he pleases. You are not your own God. And you do not have the right to demand even of God. To have it your way because of your own divinity. That is heretical. And I would say, take that. The power to speak things into existence. I said the power to speak things into existence. That is your portion in the name of Jesus Christ. I hope you followed me because what I tried to do is to show you that ultimately as we elevate man to this place of deification. Ultimately we demean God and we pull him down to the level of normal mankind. Um, ultimately, what we see here is that this individual claims, and the, the statement is made by Prophet Ed, that ultimately man has the ability to confess his own reality into existence. Uh, and he says, your portion is basically to speak by right and to decree whatever you want before God. Let me just read to you something that Ron Rhodes speaks of uh, when he speaks about the metaphys metaphysical cults and, and this new thought that is prevalent within our churches. He says the following, he says, according to the new thought, human beings can experience health, wealth, success, and abundant life by using their thoughts to define the conditions of their lives. New thought proponents subscribe to the law of attraction, and this law says that just as uh, like attracts like, so our thoughts can attract the things they want or expect. Negative thoughts are to believe to attract dismal circumstances, and positive thoughts attract more desirable circumstances. Our thoughts can be either creative or destructive, and new thought sets out, to teach people how to use their thoughts creatively. Let me just say this to you, that the word of faith contingency basically pushed this a little bit further. What they did is, is they said, uh, and they sort of tried to show us that, that ultimately our words are actually that which creates our realities. In the word of faith theology, and in these uh, prophets, sort of their professment of their faith, they basically then says to us that our confession determines our reality. And our reality is basically formed by the sum total of what we say in our minds and what we believe uh, in our hearts. Uh, let me just say this to you as well, that uh, in their universe, this universe is basically ruled uh, by universal law of faith. Uh, and in this universal law of faith, we can ultimately say that if we are creatures that are all inherently born with the ability to speak and to walk and to talk like God, that ultimately we are, there's no form of neutrality that can be achieved whenever we speak about the things of God. So we need to see that then as a result that this very God that we believe in is subservient to, this, or to these laws of faith. And ultimately what this God wants to achieve is not governed by His love, but is ultimately governed by what we professed. Uh, you know, the interesting thing of this whole theolo theological discourse is then that ultimately man is then the catalyst of what happens in his life, and man can only become that which he professes himself to be. And ultimately this leads man to be a god. Ultimately this sort of leads a man not to be subservient to the creator, but it brings man to an understanding where he is that very creator. And this is just absolutely problematic in its own sense. Uh, the name of Jesus, and I've seen it over and over again in these clips, that the name of Jesus is ultimately that which gives them carte blanche to do and to say and to impose authority as they want. And ultimately the name of Jesus is not something which is revered, but something that is professed to achieve what they want. Uh, and this reminds me, and I think, uh, D.R. McConnell in his book, excellent book, writes and he says that basically in the early uh, Canaanite and Egyptian religions, that is exactly what these individuals set out to do. They set out to confess and profess somebody's name or their God's name so that they could force and twist things that they want. This is exactly what we see. And I want to read you something from his book where he speaks and ultimately gives us an interpretation of what we need to see when we look at these individuals and the interpretation of what they actually want achieved. He says the following, 
He says, God did not need faith to create the world, and He does not need faith to hold the world together. God's word has no power apart from God Himself. His will, His sovereignty, His holiness, and His love. His word has all power because God has all power. Man can indeed appropriate God's power by believing His word, but the power is from God, not from positive confession or even from man. He writes the following, and I want to end off with this. He says the following. He says, a man whose faith is, is, is in his own faith is a man whose faith is in himself. It is a faith in self, not God. Biblical faith is always theocentric, that's God-centered, rather than anthropocentric, being man-centered. A man's faith is placed not in his own faith, the optimism of his thinking and the positiveness of his confession. The man who is positive enough can manipulate spiritual laws that can control God. And this is not biblical. Just as humanism, man not God, is in the driver's seat. Ultimately, this is exactly what we are saying. If God is subservient to the laws of this universe, and if God is subservient even to your confession of faith, God cannot be sovereignly God. And ultimately, if man has the ability to command God and to remind God of his promises to such a degree that God has to perform it, then man is in control. And as we've just read in the previous sort of clip in Psalms 150, then ultimately that very man is not the one that is subservient to the God that declares himself to be sovereign. Uh, there's a last sort of one that I want us to look at and end off with. But let me just say this to you, that ultimately that God is the one that is in control. God is the one that is sovereign. And God in himself will give his glory to no man. Have you not seen how Moses would be able to stand in front of God and point at God? God said, I'm going to kill all the Israelites. And Moses stood before God and said, repent from your anger. And the Bible has got the audacity to tell us, and God repented from his anger. God wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and is holding a bucket of petroleum, <laughs> petrol and paraffin, and a box full of matchsticks. He's saying, I'm going to say, ah! guys, we can't go there. Let's pass by Abraham. Tell him what we are about to do. I'm talking about men that acted like they were in the boardroom with jehovah that god it seems as if god was afraid god is never afraid but it seems as if god was afraid that if i just kill sodom and gomorrah without telling abraham i'll be in trouble you know imagine the audacity of going to god the sovereign god and saying to him repent First of all, the assumption is made that what God wanted to do was ultimately evil and therefore this God is morally impure. This is not true. You know, and uh, in actual fact, I've actually dealt with Muslims with this uh, portion of scripture and it actually comes from Exodus chapter 32. Uh, and ultimately, when we read this passage of scripture, we need to understand that first of all, uh, you know, I need to say that this world where, where it speaks and it says that God turned away, uh, you know, that that word evil uh, is obviously not something that is translated in the in the right sort of form because ultimately we know that God is not evil and whatever God does uh, in reference to his morality is ultimately uh, pure. Uh, but when we look at this Hebrew word raha, it's R-A hyphen H, uh, A-H, ultimately that very word speaks of, of sort of trouble. It can speak of a affliction that will come upon someone. But ultimately, the second portion that is uh, in, brought into dispute here is where God is called to repentance. Now, just think what your God is if he has to repent of a sin. He's not God. And, and just think of the absurdity that, that this prophet angel is saying, that ultimately this God repented from his sin. You know, this is just absolutely, it baffles me beyond comprehension. The second word that is used in Hebrew here is naham, N-A-C-H-A-M. And ultimately, this word 
uh, sort of does not denote sort of a sinful action where God had to sort of repent from. But ultimately it speaks of an action where God subsides and ultimately what God wanted to do or what God wanted to roar to the nation of Israel, that he turns away and takes an alternative course. It does not violate the moral integrity of God, but secondly, it does not violate the decree of God. And when Moses speaks to God, in actual fact, when Moses pleads on behalf of these people, he's speaking for God's grace and he's pleading for the sovereignty of God in that grace. He's not just giving the right and asking and pointing his finger to God, saying to God, you repent. That is not what we see. This is not the God of holiness, which Isaiah observed in the book of Isaiah. And when he looks upon him on his holy throne, highly lifted up, he says, I repent, I repent because of the holiness of what I've seen. They're playing with God. The God that these guys are actually promulgating and these guys are speaking about is not the biblical God in the full expression of his glory. It is a God that is brought down to be God, just, just mankind's normal friend and, and this cozy God that, that makes you feel good. You know, this is not the biblical God. The second thing he mentions is that before God went to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, God ultimately makes a turn to get sort of the right from Abraham to do this. And ultimately, what a fallacy. God does not need man's uh, uh, right or man's command to do what he wants to achieve. Ultimately, God is sovereign and God does what he wants. Ultimately, the reason for stopping at Abraham is ultimately because God is here working out his sovereign purposes with Abraham and, and trying to put in motion his, his covenant blessing that would extend to all mankind. But God is not here in any way or form coming or going to Abraham being scared, saying, oh, okay, can I go to Sodom? Abraham didn't have any right over Sodom. God has got the right over Sodom. And isn't it interesting that God ultimately goes and he destroys Sodom. And even though Abram again stands in the gap for his, for his cousin Lot, ultimately God uses this as an opportunity to extend grace to Lot. You know, these individuals must really look at their theology because this is just absolutely absurd. Now, I want you to understand, there are two words there, image and likeness. And the first word, word image means Adam had a hand like God's hand. Because remember the Bible says, he that created an ear, does he not hear? And remember when he was passing by the children of Israel, he said something. He said, they will only see my, that means God has got a backbone. Then the Bible says, I will hold them with my hands. That means God has got the hands. Behold, I looked. God looks. He has got eyes. So God fixed the image part. And he said to Adam, move. And Adam did like this. God said, boy, you look like Papa. <laughs> so put another leg. Ah, you walk like me. Raise your hand, Adam. Ah, the hand just looks like mine. So God said, I finish the image part. And let me shock you a little bit. The height of God and the height of Adam was the same. You ask, you ask me, how do you know? I'm a prophet that was there. It's a very short journey to go back. Oh, for prophets, it's a very short journey. I just open my eyes and see. How do I know Adam was the same height? Because Adam hmm, cannot be shorter than God. Because if Adam is shorter than God, God, in order to talk to Adam, he has to bow. And God does not bow to anybody. You know, this is very interesting again. If you, if you make God come down to your level, obviously you would want God to be exactly what you are. And scripturally we can see that in the Old Testament, both in the Old and New Testament, that the fact that have been stated is that God has got no form. And we can see, for instance, in John 4, verse 24, it speaks of God being spirit. Uh, Jesus speaks of a spirit in Luke chapter uh, 24, verse 39, that a spirit has no flesh and body or flesh and bones.
And when it speaks of the hand of God, when it speaks of the back of God, uh, we can see quite clearly that Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9 speaks that God in himself is not a man. Uh, we can see that God cannot be seen according to Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 12, John chapter 1 verse 18, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Uh, so we can go on and on and on. So when it speaks of scripture that describes the hand span of God, uh, it is simply uh, anthropomorphic language uh, that have basically been used figuratively in the Old Testament to describe God in human terms. Uh, ultimately, uh, we need to understand that scripture uses metaphoric language to basically uh, give a description of God in his working and in his person and in his self-revelation. So there's nothing confusing about this. But you see what these prophets have to do in sort of the humanist, humanistic spiritualism is they have to make God more man to give themselves more credibility. Uh, and let me just also answer off by saying the following. That there's an incredible difference between who Jesus is in the hypostatic union, in his uniqueness, and ultimately what these guys profess and proclaim to be when they call themselves son of, sons of God. Uh, there's a great difference between the uniqueness of God and ultimately between the uniqueness of man. But ultimately we need to see that there's a very vast difference because, uh, uh, in Scripture between the, the absolute transcendence of God and the imminence of man. Uh, and ultimately I would also caution those who listen to this clip. You know, usually when I make clips about prophets, I receive about a million emails and I also receive quite a few comments on these clips that I'm a racist, that I'm going only after black prophets. Let me just say this to you, that this conference of Prophet Ubert, I actually received uh, at Kubis von, von Rensburg at a conference he hosted where this gentleman was preaching at his church. And ultimately, yes, I'm also investigating white prophets and I'm also investigating individuals that have prophesied and have said things that are not true. And in future, we will also receive and make clips about them as well. But let me just caution you and say this to you. If you fell into the trap to listen to these individuals and to believe that you're a God or you're a little God, and if you believe in any way or form that there's something inherent in yourself that can bring forth a, a progenitive means of you to attain your own formative salvation or your own formative finances, and you know, let me just say to you that how can the potter hear from the clay how can one that is created command the almighty we do not command the almighty i do not care if you have your formula of faith i do not prefer, uh, uh, you know uh, proclaim even if you hold on to you know powerful word theology none of these things can proportionately put you in a place where you are divinized or even give you the right to command the ultimate God. Trust me, I've been in this. I've been caught by Word of Faith theology. I've been part of a Word of Faith church for many years. I've taught these things. I've lived them through. And ultimately, I can say to you that this looks so attractive because it's so pragmatic. But ultimately, it is a lie. It is a lie from the devil. Make sure we get your theology. If you're struggling, if you want to talk with me, please phone me, give me a call, send me an email. Please, please do not stay uh, hooked to these doctrines at the expense of your salvation and at the expense of God. Be blessed. I love you. But please remember that when you stand and when you look at these individuals, that ultimately everyone stands accountable to this one God that we love and serve in our Lord Jesus Christ. Be blessed through God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. And I pray for every single individual out there that's caught by these heresies and these false teachings, that you would ultimately see the light and see God for who He is. Be blessed. Uh, please be reminded to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also to look at our Facebook page, to look for us on the internet and to make sure that you find us wherever we are. Thanks a lot.